everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, I am very excited to have Nick Fit in the studio. He is going to educate me on everything about the gay adult industry. Um, surprisingly enough, a lot of people outside of the adult industry don't know this, but there's always been like a huge separation between the straight and the gay industry. So like, even though I've worked in porn for 20 years, I know almost nothing about the gay industry. And um, Nick's going to answer all my questions about it. And he's going to tell us about his work for um, uh, uh, against HIV stigma and all of his advocacy stuff. And he's a board member on the PASS system. So we're going to talk about testing. And um, I'm just, I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And I'll do my best to educate you on the entire gay industry. <laughs> <laughs> tell me everything. Go. Um, so I guess... From let's start with um, how did you get into the adult industry? That's always kind of like a good intro question. Ten years ago, when I was, I'm going to be well. Happy belated birthday! I noticed oh, your birthday you. was September the fifth. Mine's yes. the twenty eighth. So Libras and Virgos were good people. Happy um, we'll birthday! Just put that out there happy for everybody. soon birthday and happy belated birthday. Thank you. So it was about ten, eleven years ago. I did porn for like a year, and I was like tan to the max with horrible bleach blonde hair. It's like, you know, when Facebook pulls up the photos and you're like, oh, 10 years ago. And you're like, oh my God, why didn't anybody tell me like I look like that? Yeah, <laughs> totally. So um, I did it for a year and decided that maybe it's not for me and I wanted to pursue other things and went on and did some other stuff. And when I quit my job and started to do some of the stuff we'll get to later, I was like, you know, maybe I'll try this again. Two days after making a Twitter profile, like I get a phone call from Shishi LaRue. And I was like, how the hell did you get this number? And she's like, girl, I get everyone's number. And I was like, okay, can't believe I'm talking to you on my phone. Like, uh-huh. like you just called me. And she was like, come to a movie. And I was like, well, where are you shooting? And she was like, LA. And I was like, okay, it's convenient. Um, I said, but I don't know if I want to do that because like doing porn is like eating like a French fry or one potato chip. You can't just have one. Like you you have to have the whole thing. Yeah. You have to do more and then you want the burger and then it just goes on and on. So (laughs) I was like, okay, I'll do one movie. And now here we are talking about it. So, right. Right. So it's been two years since that happened, but it's been a good two years come back. Yeah. So what, um, what made you stay in the industry this time around? Um, What made me stay was is that there's a lot of people in the industry that I feel um, need help. Mm -hmm. And I think that I was trying to um, first prove a point to myself that I could come back and do this. But then I realized it's not about me. It's really about a lot of other people. And then as I started to meet people and talk to people, um, become better known, I realized that there was a lot of uh, stigma. There was a lot of help that people needed. There was a lot of... um, I don't want to say discrimination. I hate that word, but there was just a lot of like things going on that like just didn't sit right with me. And Mm -hmm. um, I know some people um, do this for a living and they're very dependent upon their paychecks. And a lot of people aren't in a position to stand up and say, Hey, that's not right because they need that paycheck from that studio. And I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I can say, Hey, that's not right. I don't like that. And we can talk about it and I don't have to worry about honestly, whether or not they want to hire me. Mm. So okay, I want to be the voice for the people that have little to no voice. And I want to be the person that can help educate people um, and kind of stand up for the little guy or the people that are kind of like overlooked. Okay. Yeah. That's, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, um, in the straight industry, there's been a lot of, especially since the Me Too movement came out, there's been so much talk around consent and boundaries. And um, there's been a lot of people who've been outed who have been violating people's boundaries for years. And, um, you know, finally we're kind of like starting to talk about it and performers are starting to feel like they have a voice. Are you experiencing the same thing? Kind of, sort of. It wasn't so much that. It was more of like um, finding out that like certain studios on the gay side wouldn't hire HIV positive models. Okay. It's like, that's interesting to me. Like I know on the straight side, there's a a stance that we can talk about. But on the gay side, I was like, really? Like 40 years later after the epidemic, like we still won't hire people or work with people. And Mm -hmm. a lot of people are more educated, I would say so, on the Mm -hmm. gay side because it's something they deal with every day. And it was just shocking to me. And I was like, you know, I want to find out like the method to the madness. Like why? Like how do we reach those conclusions? Is it a legal standpoint? We just don't want to deal with it. Is it blatant discrimination? Like what's going on here? And that just led me to asking more and more questions and just, you know, I'm on like this path to find the truth. So it was so much, it was more about that. 
and really wanting to set facts straight. Like sometimes you'll hear somebody tweet something or see something that you're just like, oh my God, that's just so wrong. Mm -hmm. It's like, not, not that like it's wrong what you said, but like how you said it and the content is just totally inaccurate. It's not fact-based. It's like, did you make this up? It's like the people that don't believe in global warming. Like why was it 105 in LA the other day? Like, come on. Yeah. 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 So I just feel like, you know, there's a lot that can be done that we need to address and go forward. And it's funny because in the beginning of, you know, when you were introducing us, you said that um, there's kind of like the gay side and the straight side. I feel like there's not like a unified adult industry. I feel like it's right. very that left and right. Yes, absolutely. So that brings me to ask you about um, the testing procedures and all of that on the gay side, because on the straight side, we, you know, we test every two weeks. Um, Most studios do not use condoms. Even if you do use condoms, you still have to have a clean test. And if you are HIV positive, there is zero way that you're working in the straight industry. So can you tell me how it works for you guys? So for the gay side of the industry, um, if you are HIV positive, undetectable, we'll start with that. You a lot of companies now will pair you with somebody else that is undetectable. Mm-hmm. Um, Can you explain for people who don't aren't really well versed on HIV and yeah, I'm getting the, ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah, and, and but I mean I know what you're talking about, but I know there's so many people that are so uneducated on HIV and like the leaps and bounds that we have made in terms of um, treatments and what undetectable means. So undetectable uh, means that your viral load is your HIV viral load is less than 200 copies per drop of blood. Okay. So at that point, you are considered undetectable. Um, science today has proven that somebody that maintains that viral load takes their medication regularly, lives a healthy lifestyle, um, cannot effectively pass that on to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll go on record and say that I am HIV positive myself, mm-hmm. um, and I have had relationships with people that chose to be on. Prep or not, use condoms or not, and there's never been a transmission that's happened. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of like living proof that that's like a scientific thing. Um, mm-hmm. But the science is out there. Um, so if you were to get tested, um, we can't test through PASS. We, um, we'll talk about that later, but through talent testing services, um, we do test. We test for everything. Um, then you get an H- HIV test. Um, should your test come back um, positive, undetectable, they'll get the viral load and then they'll clear you to work with somebody else who's undetectable. Um, and that's up to the studio's discretion. Um, there are a lot of gay studios that do not test. Mm-hmm. I heard that. Um, and then there's a lot of studios that say, oh, because you're positive and this person's positive, we really don't need to test you because we know what you have. And mm-hmm. that to me is a problem because like, what about hep C, chlamydia, yeah, gonorrhea, HPV, whatever else you got going on. Like, you know, that's, you know, I understand that, you know, yes, I have the possible worst case scenario outcome, but there's, you know, I care about my health too. Mm -hmm. So like, maybe we should like be looking at these things. So, uh, but most of the reputable, uh, bigger name studios do test. They do, um, care about their model's health and all of that. They require clean tests to come back. They require it every 14 days, same as the straight side of the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are people out there that don't do that or studios that test models, uh, through like the health department of like the state that they're filming it and stuff like that. And they ask the models to bring that in. I think that that's a little bit unethical. Right. So then I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to explain to people who don't, if you listen to a lot of my podcasts, you know, all this stuff, but the past system is the database that the adult industry uses that whenever anybody tests, who wants to work in the adult industry, your test results go into the past system. And only people who are registers as perform, uh, sorry, as producers, people who work in the industry can access that past system can see, whether or not you you pass or not so and to uh, clear things uh, just to uh, make it clear nobody undetectable through talent testing services is uh your dashboard like so my dashboard will still show up red mm-hmm. but i'm not cleared right but the pdf that gets sent to me will say that they've reached the undetectable viral load and then that i'm able to share with the producers and the scene partners that i'm working with to keep the hiv status confidential right um it's punishable by like 50 years in prison like if yeah. you do that so it's like that's a really difficult like hard to navigate we'll talk about that in and how we're trying to figure it all out and get everything right. going. Um, so that's how that works. So you will be uncleared. So you'll still remain red. So everybody can see, okay, there's something that's, you know, going on here. But we don't know exactly what it is. We don't know exactly is, what right? it is for the discretion, uh, the privacy of the patient performer. And then, but the studios do know when they request that PDF from you. Mm-hmm. And then you're giving them consent to have that. 
Right. Okay. All so right, it's not like you can just get cleared and green checks through talent testing and be like, hey, great. Like, here we go. Let's make yeah. it happen. So like, yeah. it's very protected. And I can tell you from like a personal standpoint, like um, there's nobody trying to like surpass that. There's really no way to surpass that. Um, mm-hmm. There are two tests that are done. One that's just the regular HIV test, the qualitative test, and there's the quantitative test that was added also. So um, when you go to talent testing services, they you're basically tested twice for HIV to make sure that they're getting an accurate result. Okay, what's the difference between the two tests? One test is looking for the antibodies okay. um, that your body produces when you fight it. The other one's actually um, the blood test that is like looking for the actual viral load in your body. So it's just a extra layer of caution. Okay, so the second it's like test- having a second lock on your front door. Okay, so the second test would tell you whether or not you were undetectable. Correct. It'll give you the viral load. Okay, interesting. So I. All of this is a really interesting um, topic because I, you know, Eric Paul Louis. Yes. I always have the worst, <laughs> hardest time pronouncing his last name. I had him in here for like an hour and a half, and I and he like told me his last name a million times, and I still fucked it up. Anyway, I don't think I can say it either. So it's, it's I know funny. everyone, and everyone like looks at me when they say that, like I don't know how to say it either. But anyways, Eric, who was the uh, chairman of the FSC Correct. chairman, right? Yeah, and who's he's no longer. He stepped down. He's got another job, which I've heard is wonderful. So congratulations, Eric. But I know that he was trying to present an idea where there would be something called the Pass Plus system, um, where people with uh, who were HIV positive but who had an undetectable viral load could be tested, could be put into the system so that they could be tested for all the other STDs that we talked about, but then um, could have that in the past system. And then people who chose to work with somebody who had an undetectable viral load could do so. Do you remember? Yes, we were talking about that. Um, the, uh, HIV has been such a hot topic at these issues. It's yeah. Like when it's, anytime it's on the agenda, everybody wants to skip to that. And the whole three-hour meeting, the board meeting, just is all about that the whole time. Right. And everyone's opinion and thoughts and the doctors and attorneys are there. And it's just a lot. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but they start if you lunch, so everybody calms down after a while. And then we go back to it. So, um, yeah, no coffee at those meetings. <laughs> Just water. Um, yes, it seems archaic, but I honestly believe the best solution right now through PASS is to have the separate but equal system mm-hmm. where you have everybody in column A. And column A can be people from the straight side or people that just won't, can't. Boyfriend said no can't wrap my head around it, just will not work with undetectable for what any any reason. Right. And there'll be the separate that you, since uh, the separate, the the pass plus or B or whatever we're going to call it, this, mm-hmm. you know, we're t- working on that, um, will be people that will work with HIV undetectable positive people and people who are undetectable also. And there'll be something that says that you know that if you're in this category that one of your performers may or may not also test, you know, positive or not and you're willing to work with that person Mm -hmm. and that really leaves it up to the performer to choose and decide and I think that that's kind of where we'd like to see like the shift right but being an FSC board member I think I have to say um I'm not a doctor or pharmacist and I don't think anybody should be working with anyone that they don't want to um no one should be forced to do anything they don't want to nobody should um be lying about anything. Everyone should be crystal clear about their status. And if we do go separate but equal, people need to understand like what that means. And I think there needs to be a lot, a lot, a lot of education about it. Yeah. So people can make an informed decision. Yeah, because I can see people from the column A then refusing or being concerned about people who are willing to work with people from column B. Right. Uh, yes, that's what I think. I think that uh, column airs will look at column beers and try and, you know, figure out who's undetectable or who's not and who's crossover and who's not. And I know that a lot of crossover porn stars, um, I have a lot of friends in the industry that are getting mm-hmm. a lot of crap right now about uh, having done trans or gay porn. And they're wanting yeah. to film with a straight site and they're, you know, getting tested and everything, but people are still skeptical of that. And I'm like, as long as you're doing what you need to do, I think it's fine. Um, but yeah, I think there is going to be some pushback around that. But I think what we need to do is educate people to not have that pushback and to not have that fear. And again, no one should do anything that they don't want to do. If you don't want to work with me because of my status, that is totally fine. I respect you. That's like mm-hmm. me too. No means no. It just is what it is. Right. But at least have the open mind to hear out. You Don't just say, oh my God, HIV, turn off, red flag, abort right. mission. At least hear 
and read about it and educate yourself and make an informed decision. Don't do it based on what you've heard from co-stars or what like, you know a director has said or what your agent thinks. Like I think people owe it to themselves to be educated, to wake up a little bit. It's going to be 2020 and um, really make that educated decision. And if you still come to a no, I can't do it, I totally respect that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there is a huge lack of education on the subject because almost everybody who kind of flips out about the idea doesn't actually know anything about what undetectable means, even what prep is, um, viral loads, that kind of thing. And I've only actually learned it myself through having this podcast and having people like Eric on and like people like you on talk about it because I didn't know anything about it either. Right. Um, uh, there are some people at the FSC board meeting that were a little bit upset saying, well, you know, people should have come to us to talk to us. And my pushback was, yes, people could have come to you to talk to you. But what are you doing as an individual and board member to educate yourself, to help educate your followers on Twitter? And while right. prep or something or working with somebody positive might not be right for you, some girl that just turned 18 or boy that just turned 18 or somebody that wants to, for whatever reason, enter this business. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's like give them the chance and opportunity to make the decision or let's at least say, hey, well, this might not be for me. Maybe it's for you and maybe, you know, I can help educate you. And mm-hmm. it's okay that it's not for you, but it might be right for somebody else. So I think right. that we shouldn't be denying people what they want or at least the education bit. I think that we owe that as, you know, people that work in the industry to help educate those that are coming on board. And, you know, someone turns 18 every day and wants to do this. So I yeah. think that we should start it off right and not have the stigma fear and the black flags flying. How do you think would be the best way to reach people and educate people? Because I think that uh, many of us know that a lot of, especially younger people don't particularly feel like reading anything or actually like follow up on research. You know what I mean? Like it's hard to reach people who don't kind of even want to. It's hard. And I don't think there's a clear answer, but um, Personally, I think that the studios, casting directors, and talent agents owe it to their performers to care about their healthcare a little bit more than they do. Mm. Um, I do think the studios that don't test and all of that that's going on, I really want to say, like, shame on you. Mm-hmm. Like, you should care about your performers, whether they be contractors, W-2 employees or not. Mm-hmm. You should care enough to have the common decency to care about another human being and their health. Right. And I think that that's not asking too much at all. And I think that that person will uh, respect you more. But I think the education has to start, like, you know, from the top. Everyone's looking for a mentor. People are scared. People are new. So I think that not just talking about it, but, like, encouraging people to talk about it, encouraging studios to talk about it, getting people, you know, maybe studios need to make better hiring choices as to who their directors are and to who their producers are, like, what the education piece looks like. The information and literature is out there. The lack of uh, communication is that someone's not teaching it to people. Right. And like you said, a lot of young people aren't going to come to you and say, hey, like, tell me about HIV today. (laughs) So, like, I think that, you know, we owe it to people. And I think that's part of my mission and why I want to do this. We owe it to people to talk about it, to have open, honest, scary conversations that are uncomfortable. And there's nothing wrong with continued sex ed at a studio level. Like, yes, we're all, we all, take our clothes off for money and that's what we're doing. So let's have an honest conversation about it and things that we can do. We talk about HPV and other, every other STD. So why do we exclude HIV from that conversation? Yeah. It's funny. Cause it's like, you know, when you go to work f- for most jobs, like, I don't know if you go to like work at a theme park or something like that, you have to like sit down and go through like a training program where you have to yeah. like, watch a video or something like that. Like, I wonder I mean, I know it's difficult. The adult industry is, it's actually become so much more organized in the last few years than it's ever been. But it's always been kind of all over the place and different people producing stuff, especially like with the internet being a platform that allows like anybody to produce porn anywhere and then just throw it online and make money off of it. But I wonder if there would ever be in like a utopian world, a way where like people who were coming into the industry, like literally almost had to go through a training program, like a one day, you must watch this video. You must take the quiz, at the take end. the yeah. quiz. You must read this literature. And I feel like it would, it might scare some people off, which honestly would be a good thing. Cause I think people don't know what they're getting into when they come in the adult industry. They think I'm just going to make a cup, like some quick money and then I'm going to get out. And they don't understand that there's a lot of baggage that comes with the adult industry, you know, stigma, emotional, physical stigma, psychological, there's all that stuff. I just feel like, 
I don't know. I would love that to be like, almost like you have to earn a certificate. It's almost like testing through pass. Like, why can't yeah. you do the training class and get green lighted on that? And then yeah. you can go about like your life. Like, why can't there be, maybe we need to start an organization right here, right now. Yeah, right here, right now. <laughs> <laughs> this moment. Um, and do that. But I, that's the disconnect. Like, mm-hmm. and I find myself, you know, being an HIV and prep educator, going on sets and talking to people like, Hey, like, are you on prep? Like, you know, the studio is moving bareback. You're not, well, let me help you. Like, here's what I can do for you. Or like, mm-hmm. here's what's going on. Or, but you were right. There should be something where we do that because we, we care about these people. We love these people. We work with them all the time. And there should be on some basic, simple form, like level of humanity, there should be it's, I'm sorry, I'm at a loss of words. It's, um, there should be something in place like that where mm-hmm. we can just educate people and we can just talk about it and say, hey, this is what you're signing up for. This is what your family might think. This is a lot and we can just add that into the mix. So. Yeah. I like that idea, actually, like if they had to go into past to get, because you have to get test well i guess you don't well it's also like what happens afterwards okay great you tested for hpv and you have three of the five deadly strands but you're cleared to shoot okay that's great you're cleared to shoot you go shoot you make your money but now you're sitting with this information that you have h you have vaginal hpv that maybe you have strands 17 19 and 21 which Mm -hmm. are bad Mm -hmm. and maybe you know what do you do with that Mm. where's the pamphlet that says hey here's a woman's health care clinic or here's how you can apply for a medical or covered california or here's how you can do whatever to follow up with that to make sure you don't get cervical cancer to make sure you're not giving those strands to somebody else like right. here's a medication that you could take like oh you tested positive for chlamydia oh you have chlamydia like okay where's the list of clinics that they're handing out or saying here's the shot that you need or the pills that you need to like take care of that do we There's, not provide that i don't believe so hmm. not that i know of not that i've seen not that i heard i it's kind of crazy. So you performer get performer tested positive for Hep C on a shoot that I was going to be on and had no idea what the hell it was, and I was just like, wow. I'm very shocked that you don't know what hepatitis C is. But yeah. let me help you since you reached out to me and talked yeah. to you about it and what you can do to control it and to, you know, suppress that. Also, that way you can continue to work in the industry. Yeah, I mean, there should be at least some kind of like follow up email, like, oh, so you tested positive for these things. Here are. I feel like it wouldn't be that difficult, right? Here are a list of centers that you can go to to get this taken care of. Exactly. I th- and I think a lot of the pushback is funding. I think a lot of people are like, well, who has time and this and that? And this we have so many so models true. coming out of here and the money and what are we going to do and this and that? But like with APAC and the, the some of the other people out there that are trying to do the education course, like, you know, we I think some of these organizations can step up and volunteer, whether it's FSC or not, or uh, studios themselves. Like Mm -hmm. I think that there should be a point person or somebody that goes over that with people and that we spend time talking about it. Or maybe that's in your new hire or your uh, 2257 paperwork that you sign off on. You're going to read something. You're going to take something away from it. You're going to watch a video at home and do whatever, but we need to do something. And we're talking, we're like uh, all these great ideas that we want to do and roll out. Everyone wants to do all this like great stuff, but it's like, there's no like anybody like taking a first step. And I need 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 someone to walk with me and like help me take steps. Yeah. And you mentioned funding too. And I know that that is also like a big issue. You know, when I was talking to Eric, there's not that many people like in FFC working on this stuff and everybody's so overloaded and, you know, he wants to roll forward all these projects and do all this stuff, but it's just you know, they need funding to do it because people can't work for free. We all have bills to pay. No, people can't work for free. Um, it's to my understanding that OnlyFans and some of the other pay sites have done a little bit of damage to the uh, traditional porn companies, which is true. Yes. There's now profit share happening. It's kind of like what Uber and Lyft did to taxi services. Yes. Um, in Vegas, I see more people on the Uber line than the taxi line. Yes. So I understand the frustration there coming from the studios. And I understand the you know willingness of capitalism wanting to work. Right. Um, but I think that if everybody did something, if everybody mm. did just a little bit more, mm. like I think that we would be able to really like, you know, get around this because we've been talking about it for so many years now and it's like okay like we're still at an impasse like how do we how do we move past that right right so for those of you who are listening and feel like i feel like i would like to contribute to the fsc and help them out you can actually go to fsc.com thank you and And you you can can, there's a donate button there's a donate button right um uh the fsc also if you look at their twitter at fsc army um there or fsc pass um you can look at the donations and they also give out money to performers who cannot afford their tests and stuff like that so Mm -hmm. you can apply to get funding there um i 
don't know the dollar amount off the top of my head. It was, I think, several thousand dollars last month went to pay for people's health care, women's tests, not just gay. It's straight, yeah. too. It's for everybody that needs help. They're there yeah. to help you. I mean, they have those resources there, um, but you have to ask. And I think that's the thing is a lot of people don't want to ask or ignorance is blessed. If I don't know, it can't hurt me. I don't know. So it's right. like, but yes, you can go to those websites. You can contribute. Um, you can sign up for the minimal educational training that's there, but yes, you support the FSC. Yes, do that. All right. Uh, speaking of support, we're going to take a quick commercial break uh, to hear from our sponsors who support my podcast. Hey. <laughs> Are you a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered? Of course you are. Well, I need your help to keep this show going. This is why I've set up a Patreon account where you can donate to support my show. And in exchange, you can be eligible for all kinds of cool, fun perks and prizes, which include autographed DVDs and books. See, you guys, she's actually signing shit. Free membership passwords to my website, hollyrandall.com. Free mugs, pens, shirts, bags, all kinds of really cool stuff. So take care of me and I will take care of you. I will not only be able to continue to produce this podcast with really awesome, inspiring content about your favorite adult stars, but I will also give back to you in terms of all the cool, fun perks and prizes that we offer. So please, please support me at patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. And thank you guys so much for your support. I could not do this without you. Okay, we're back. So um, we just spent about the first half of the podcast talking about um, testing, about HIV, about stigma, about the past system. Is there anything else that you want to? I just encourage people again to. uh, I know that GayVN and AVN are going to be uh, teaming up with the FSC and PASS to come up with a uh, panel, more discussions, bring in more doctors, um, professionals to speak on the subject to really like end stigma. And again, while I don't think anybody should be forced to do anything they don't want to do, encourage everybody out there to at least do your part and get educated and make a decision based on the information that you have gathered from reputable sources and to just do your best to be open-minded and to uh, be accepting of others, um, allowing others to work maybe separate but equal in the industry and really just calming down with the poor crossover people that are getting so much heat right now for what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty brutal. It's not as bad as it used to be. But it's still definitely bad. I remember um, he still works. Uh, Christian XXX, you know him? Mm. Yeah. So we used to shoot him quite a bit. And he had done um, some gay porn on the side. I know he did some trans stuff. And man, when like girls would find out that he had done that, they would not want to work with him. It was a problem that we had a lot. And we really liked him. We liked working with him. And obviously, we're not going to tell girls like, you know, you can't decide that like you can do whatever you want and I'm not going to like argue with them but it was it was it was a lot yeah (laughs) the other thing I want to say about you know the straight side is is it's great that you test everybody every 14 days but let's say you test somebody 14 days out Mm -hmm. and their shoot is exactly 14 days from that test date they Mm -hmm. go out and they party do whatever they want whatever what if they contract HIV two days after that test yeah and they're still within the window of opportunity So we're going to discriminate against people who have HIV, who are undetectable, who scientifically cannot pass along the virus to anybody. And we know that, and that is fact-based and not one onset transmission has occurred from an undetectable person ever in the history of porn. But we're going to test people 14 days out, get their negative result, let them do whatever they want up into that shoot, but and then we're going to shoot them. Right, right. Assuming and hoping that they're still negative and not within that window of opportunity. And that window of opportunity, when you contract the virus, you can say or convert right away. Some people, it takes a week. It's different for everybody. So I think that we are opening ourselves up to a lot of risk and not focusing our energy on what we need to. I always say, like, if you have great arms at the gym, don't work out arms every day. Work out a different <laughs> part of your body. Yeah. We know HIV undetectable is not transmittable. We have the fact-based science, but what is going on with people that are negative that are not taking Truvada as prep and stuff like that. And what's really happening in those 13 days between the test and your shoot. And mm. I think that's what I kind of want the question I want to leave with everybody. Yeah, that's actually, that's a good point. Um, almost in a way working with a non-detectable HIV positive person. Like we're safer. so focused on yeah. this, this 
undetectable thing and what it means that we're letting everything else just kind of happen because we're so focused on this. Yeah. And if we would just break some of the focus, really educate ourselves on this and then pay attention to what everybody else is doing, Mm -hmm. I think we really, really would make some progress here and and becoming a more unified adult industry together without the separate. What can you tell us to uh, quickly for those who don't know what Truvada is? Truvada was originally an HIV uh, medication, um, one that I've taken um, since I found out that I was positive in 2006. Um, um, and while they were treating positive people with it, they were noticing that to break it down, real simple, it, that it was putting like a force field around your T cells, and your T cells are the measure of your immune system, and they're like little photocopiers and they pump out cells in your body like on steroids. So when HIV enters the body, it looks immediately for a T cell because it can't live on its own and it injects its DNA into the T cell, turning the T cell into an HIV positive T cell. And instead of pumping out copies of uh, good blood and good stuff, it starts pumping out millions of copies of the HIV virus. Mm -hmm. But Truvada, for lack of a better explanation, put kind of like a force field around that T cell. Mm. So as the HIV enters the body and it's swimming and trying to find a T cell, it kind of hits the wall and can't penetrate the cell and inject its DNA into it. And it kind of just dies. So Truvada- That's actually the most like- Simplified, Simplified yeah. <laughs> explanation I've ever heard of Truvada. It, well, it, that's what, it, so, the, so, yeah, so for lack of a better term, it's put a force field around your T-cell and it's protected your T-cells. Um, it reduces uh, infections by 92%. Nothing can be 100%. There's always a margin of error driving mm-hmm. down the street. There's a margin of error. Like, I would like to get home alive safely. Do I know I'm going to get home safe? I hope. Yeah. But like, you know, so... You know, for everyone that says, oh, well, they're at that 8%. And it's like, okay, girl, like, calm down. Like, yeah. We got it. So, yeah, it puts a force field around your cells, for lack of a better explanation. And it will not allow HIV to penetrate. Uh, for men, it takes seven days to be 100% effective in your system. Women is 20 days. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, now, if you're HIV undetectable, do you also, or does your partner also take PrEP? Not being a doctor or pharmacist, um, Yes or no. So um, it could be either way. Well, so my ex um, was FTM trans mm-hmm. and he decided that he did not want to take PrEP mm-hmm. because he knew of my undetectable viral load. And we mm-hmm. had vaginal sex unprotected many times. And mm-hmm. we were more worried about having a child than we were mm-hmm. um, him getting positive. And he still tests uh, negative to this day. But he made that choice that he didn't want to do that because he understood the science and did some research and spoke to my doctor and realized that, you know, I don't want to be taking this pill if I don't have to. Right. But I do encourage anyone whose body is healthy enough to um, stomach Truvada to take it. Um, People that have uh, healthy liver and kidney functions that aren't out there drinking like crazy, um, I would encourage you to talk to your physician about it. I think it's something that everyone that has sex, uh, men, women, should really be on or should really at least consider their options and weigh that out as to whether or not it's an option for them. Okay. So it can have adverse side effects for some people. It can. Some people feel nauseous or bloated. Um, at first, nobody likes that. Um, mm. It is a strong medication that you're introducing into your body, mm-hmm. um, but it's meant to do great things. And I'll tell you what, the toxicity of Truvada and uh, Truvada going into Discovy, the new pill that's going to be prep coming out soon, um, is a lot less toxic than the HIV medication I put on my body every day. Mm. I, I wish in 2006 that prep was available because I thought I was in a committed relationship. And that we were going to buy a house and a puppy and a pony. And I was 19 years old. And that didn't work out for me so well, did it? Oh, man. But no, it's a hard story. But um, I think it's a story worth sharing because I think that right now, today, you don't have to be HIV positive. There are so, there's so much information out there. There are so many people that want to help you. There are so many ways to access this drug. There's just so much. Um, and the drug itself that you can take that will prevent that from happening. Mm-hmm. And to add to that, um, the... Most people getting uh, the Center for Disease Control, if you go to their website, the people that are getting HIV the most now are heterosexual females and black men. Wow. Um, Now, you also run a nonprofit as well. Uh, It's called the Adherence Project. It is starting up. It's going to be, there will be an office in Palm Springs. There'll be an office in Los Angeles. And then we're looking to go to Orange County, Newport Beach. Um, It is a team of doctors, doctors. attorneys, uh, some public figures, uh, people prominent um, in all sides of the community, some labs that are really um, 
trying to keep people adherent to medication. So it started out because a lot of us were HIV positive and it's important for positive people to stay adherent to their medication. Mm-hmm. But then we were like, well, what about people staying adherent to PrEP and really making sure they're taking care of themselves and other people? So then we started to branch out to that. And then what about people, you know, trans people staying adherent to their hormones and stuff mm-hmm. like that? Or um, people that need therapy or people staying adherent to committing to staying off drugs or living a sober life or whatever it is going on. So we are the Adherence Project, keeping people adherent to their lifestyle and making sure that they're making the best possible choices for them and for the people that are around them. Mm -hmm. And so we do rehab, uh, helping trans people get hormones, taking people off the street, drug rehab, uh, HIV medication, um, setting people up for HIV benefits um, that you might not know that you're available to you, getting people access to Truvada, which is $2,200 a bottle. It's so crazy. Wow. PrEP is $2,200 a bottle. It's crazy. How many, how, how long does a bottle last you? 30 days. Jesus. So I'm not a mathematician, but I'm sure that uh, comes out to a lot of money per pill. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it'd be tr- cheaper to have a drug habit. Um, but um, no, so um, if you can't afford it, if there's no way to uh, for you to get it, we can help you with that. There is funding that's available, um, something called PrEP AP. It works similar to ADAP, which is the Age Drug Assistance Program in California. And the state has set aside a couple billion dollars for that to help people. So I think in the last, I want to say two years of doing this, we've helped 1,500 people within all 50 states. It doesn't have to just be here local to Los Angeles. Like we, we can help you wherever you are. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, <laughs> it's my phone is uh, blowing up constantly. I'm sure I have a hundred text messages from right now. I, uh, keeping people adherent to medications, making me not be adherent to my, <laughs> to, to <laughs> not making me adherent to like, you know, my life and having, yeah. you know, peace of mind. Uh, but people need help. And I think people are afraid to ask for help. And I think that if you are down on your luck or you're embarrassed about a drug program or you're, uh, uh, I mean, drug addiction or you're embarrassed about, um, doing porn and no one really ever talked to you about sex or, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the mental issues that people are, you know, starting to become more vocal about on Twitter. I Mm -hmm. think that, um, the adherence project's a safe spot for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you're going to Palm Springs pride, uh, you'll see us out there on arenas Avenue in Palm Springs. Um, there'll be a big booth. There'll be some porn stars, giveaways, photo booth, all kinds of crazy doing everything to draw attention to this booth. So you'll see it. Mm -hmm. Um, but really, we just want to help anyone that needs help. It doesn't have to be specifically prep, but it can be um, any facet of any area of your life that you need. Um, and it's all free. Even if you can't get to a lab to get your labs drawn, we can send someone to your phlebotomist to your house for free to draw the medicine. And then a doctor can FaceTime with you to talk about the prescriptions and stuff like that and wow. get everything going. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible. It's not easy, but we're trying yeah. to make it easy for everybody else. So yeah. and somebody has to do it. Yeah, no kidding. Wow, that's a lot. Um, I actually have a question for you about um, just uh, the gay porn industry and in, in general. Now, I know that one of the big niches is like turning straight men gay, right? And we have that too with, with, um, like for twisties, like one of our, um, one of our lines is like turning like a straight girl lesbian, even though that's gay, but like for some reason in the straight industry, like girl, girl is not considered gay. Hey, I got a lot of heterosexual <laughs> female followers on Twitter that watch gay porn. Cause they're like, if my husband can watch lesbian porn, why can't I watch gay porn? I'm doing a podcast about that tomorrow. And I was like, you know what? Like, do you? Like- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you- that's interesting actually. So before I want to ask you about that too, but so these guys that do this, like, you know, straight men being turned gay and you hear about like gay for pay. Is that an actual thing? Are there quite a few men who consider themselves straight that are working in the great gay porn industry for money? Or is not that just too a many facade? that I, not too many that I know. I would say most people that I know uh, that do crossover porn would consider themselves to be pansexual. I know mm-hmm. there's a term for everything now. So yeah, no I, I think that that's the current term as of today. I'll have right. to check. But, um, <laughs> no, I would think they consider themselves pansexual, that they're attracted to a little bit of everything. Mm. And it's... Um, it's interesting to me because I think that I would consider myself to be that way also. I dated somebody FTM trans exclusively for three years. Mm-hmm. And I think that you look at the beauty of a person and you want to do something. Um, I don't think anybody in their right mind would just do it for the money um, mm. because you can make good money on both sides. But I think that you would be attracted to the person or something about the situation a person makes you want to do that. 
I mean, I've heard, I, I know a few guys that work in the straight industry that did like one or two videos and, you know, kind of, I guess, wish they hadn't and said that they did it for money. Um, I've heard that you can make a lot more money in the gay industry as the a gay top, male performer. The top performers in the, or the top studios in the gay industry do pay very well. Can you give us like an idea? Uh, What's like the highest? Okay. So like for a girl in the industry, right? Like a pretty standard boy girl rate is a thousand to 1200 a scene. 1500 a scene is like a lot. You're up there. 2000 a scene, I think would be the most anybody would charge for a girl, for a girl. And you would have to be like top, 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 like, in crazy demand. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 across the board. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what is, what are like the rates like for you guys? So I've heard of some really in desire million follower on Instagram, people getting paid $3,500 a scene. Um, wow. that's rare. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you that I, I I'll just say it. My scene rate is a thousand to twelve hundred dollars per scene. Whatever, okay, so whatever like studio I'm working for, the same as as us. It is, and then there are some people that are exclusive to certain studios that I think they get. I've heard people getting paid like twenty five, twenty two hundred, and take that with a grain of salt. People yeah. will tell you what they get paid, and maybe you know, maybe they add a no, that, few hundred dollars on. But I think that the standard rate in the industry, what I hear is good pay for men, is about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. Okay, so so where does this mystery? Where does this? Um, well, there's some fringe benefits too to working on the gay side. Okay. Like the studios will pay for your tests, so we do not pay out of pocket for tests. Oh, there are credit cards on file over at the uh, talent testing and pass and all that. So okay. the gay studios will pay for that. So you're actually keeping your twelve hundred dollars. And then a lot of gay um, talent agents bill the studio separate. So the model doesn't also have to take money out of their check to pay their agent. So their agent bills the studio separate. So there's a few things we got kind of worked out. And the the gay side also pays for travel. So if they want somebody from Toronto to film in LA, they'll pay for them to fly here. So you're getting flown here for free. You're getting your thousand dollars. You're getting your hotel room paid for. You're getting your test paid for. So your total compensation is what, like twenty six hundred dollars? Mm. Plus they feed you lunch every day on the set and everything. Yeah. So um, and I know for working for Mile High, they do a really nice lunch every day on the set. Yeah. So um, if you're fortunate enough to work for Icon Mail or uh, Noir Mail, you're going to get fed well. But so I think the total compensation, when you factor in everything that they're doing for you, it comes out to like. $2,600 or so. Right. I do know the big studios in the straight industry will do the same thing for like mm-hmm. certain desired porn stars. So but it is for everybody across the board. It's standard. Wow. Okay. So you guys do have a little bit, a little bit more. Studios there. prefer if you live in the area where you're shooting, of course, right. or if you're going to be in New York and you say, Hey, cocky boys, I'm going to be in New York. Would you want to possibly film with me? Maybe they'll say yes while mm-hmm. you're there. And great. They save some money. You're already on your trip. You got your Airbnb. Great. We'll just give you a scene rate and we're good to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that's the ideal situation. Yeah. Um, and I know that there's a lot of gay porn stars that do like some females travel around and mm-hmm. have their dates planned out and they contact agents or studios direct and say, Hey, from I'm going to be in Montreal, Quebec, Seattle, wherever the hell. And if we can film while I'm there, great. And that works out. But yeah, usually if they want you, they'll just fly you in, put you in a hotel room, usually get the room to yourself. It's nice. Wow. <laughs> Depending upon what studio you work for. Uh, yeah. Fal- Falcon does that. Um, they put people in their own rooms and they really take care of people. So yeah. um, I don't think it's a bad gig. So I could understand why people might want to do that on the gay side. Maybe there is a little bit more money for men. Um, I'm not exactly so sure of what the scene rates are for men on the straight side. I've heard it's generally anywhere between 500 to 800. The top what I heard male was like performers max. get about yeah 800 max. So it's, it's a, uh, it's, not bad mm-hmm. if you're doing the eight hundred dollars. So, you know, there's uh, some studios here um, in LA that are local, or just you know, some studios that don't have as much traffic on them that will do like five hundred dollars, but you're only filming for like two hours, so mm-hmm. it's really like two fifty an hour. It's not bad. Yeah. So it's like, um, really depends. But I think the full compensation is like when you think about everything that you're getting, mm-hmm. not just the paycheck. Like that's nice that people are doing that. They're yeah. Reimbursing you for your Uber and for your this and your that, and they yeah. can bring us your receipts. Let us know what you ate on the way. Like you know, it's really nice of them. Oh wow, yeah, that's a lot. So you mentioned that you have a lot of female followers who like to watch your porn. Do they say like how prolific is that, and do they say why they enjoy female porn? Well. 
So is it just I was just you guys a- are all so good looking. Well, it's I mean, really not yes, fair. But- <laughs> like when I look at like gay male box covers, I'm like, fuck, dude, these guys are all so hot. I'll show you a box cover I just did with my boyfriend who's patiently sitting over here. It looks really good that Icon Mail is going to release. Uh, Cocky Boys was nice enough. He's exclusive with the Cocky Boys to lend him to film with us. So mm-hmm. it was, uh, it's a really good box cover, actually. Um, anyways, um, do you guys do a whole day, day on the box cover or is it part of the day when you it's, part of the day. It's, it's part of the day? It's part of, it's part of B-roll. There's like, okay, we're doing box cover now. Like, okay. So, okay. So you guys don't. It's kind of planned out in stage and there's people like there helping out and mm-hmm. the productions are usually big. So like, you know, there's a few people, a few photographers, lighting people, camera guys. How many you know? people generally are on a set? With Mile High, um, Noir Mail, Icon Mail, who I work with, and then I work with, uh, I'm fortunate enough to work with Falcon Studios um, uh-huh. frequently. Uh, it's um, usually one to two camera people. It's, well, two camera people for Mile High for sure. Yeah. Still photographer, director, director's assistant, and then there'll be a lighting, sound, audio person. So there could be six or seven people okay. um, in post production on the set. So you guys don't have a makeup artist, right? No, I wish we could add that. John John Blitt, if you're listening, you'd like a makeup artist. <laughs> Actually, if you work with Shishi LaRue, the director, uh, she uh, we all know that she's a famous drag queen porn director, so she'll do your makeup for you. Okay. She likes that. She always helps grooming. She always yeah, she does that. She does like your eyebrows a little bit, or if they look like caterpillars need to be cut, she'll let you know and she'll do that and you know, kind of groom you a little bit right uh-huh. before the um before the shoot, uh, just to even out your complexion a little bit. And she likes doing that. And obviously, if you work with a drag queen, they're going to put makeup on your face. So yeah. it kind of comes with the territory. <laughs> you get free makeup also. Isn't that great? It's <laughs> great to be gay, I guess. What are the most common types of videos that um, you shoot? Like, do you guys do a lot of gonzo? Do you guys do a lot of features? Like, what are the generally the most popular kinds of scenes that you do a lot of it is just scene work that's like a uh, collaborated to put together to make a video um every once in a while uh this the studios will have like a like really high budget movie when they're mm-hmm. getting ready for that that avn gay vn win like yeah. want that trophy we're gonna really make a good movie i know falcon just released five brothers sick movie mm-hmm. um, is it like a stepbrother thing it's, it's about five brothers yeah do you guys have a lot of stepbrothers uh, the porn? most uh, uh the most searches right now um i uh what i was told on the last set was that people are searching uh bareback incest and uh military so anything okay. my stepdad my drag mom's so it's friends the same my, as us. Yeah, it's the same <laughs> on both sides so uh, and I think that was uh, that's from Shishi LaRue was telling me that, and she uh, works for John Blitt from Mile High Media. Yeah. So that's the he pays attention to the searches and lets us know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I think it's the same. So we try to follow suit on both sides. So any stepsisters, cousins, friends, neighbors, dogs, <laughs> sisters, aunts, drag mom, like we're happy to shoot that. <laughs> Um, but back to the Twitter question. Uh, I know we sidetracked. Um, yeah. I was just wondering about my followers one day and I hit that analytics button and I realized that I had like 45% of my followers were female and I was like, it's very that interesting so to me. so interesting. And so I started paying attention to who. And I'm like, okay, so once you get information, you're like, okay, now what? I'm a Libra, so I'm naturally inquisitive. So I'm like, 45%. Well, which 45%? And so yeah. then I click on like what age demographic and I'm like, okay, so... I broke it all the way down to it's usually housewives or single moms that are in their 30s or 40s that are my follower. And I was like, that is so interesting to me. So we started asking some people or I noticed that people would retweet certain things or comment on everything. And so I started asking, like, what gives? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Like, why me? Like, you know, they're like, you know, because I like the story behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like straight porn where there's uh, sometimes it just goes right into the fucking right away and there's mm-hmm. not too much of like what's going on or I don't want to see like, you know, my little sister or whatever. And it kind of focuses a little bit more on the female. And they were like, we're heterosexual. So it's nice when you see the guy. Mm-hmm. And I'll admit when I watch straight porn, like I think it's hot to see the girl, but like I want to see like the guy too. Don't just yeah. like get his face in the frame, please. Like, I can know. we see his we're, face? But we're specifically told <laughs> to crop the guy out because most of our audience is male. Men right? to what? Right. They want to imagine that they're the guy. It's so funny because there's been so many girls that I have talked to and we've discussed how like, 
when I, if I'm going to watch a scene, I really like to see a lot of the guy and I like to hear the guy. I like to hear the guy talking. Like what gets me more than anything is like the guy and what he says and the dirty talk and that kind of stuff. But we're told to like, and guys have been trained to like shut up and let it be all about the girls. So shut up and fuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I can see why that would be the case. Like, right. For sure. So I know, um, like certain studios, like hockey boys puts on a very elaborate, like, uh, when they put their scenes together, they do this really beautiful, like, um, it coming together organically and how the people are talking and they're sitting poolside and they're, you know, they're, it's really like a involved storyline and they try to make it as real as possible. Mm-hmm. So they pair people that are like friends together. If that mm-hmm. sounds, I mean, sometimes it's weird working with like a friend of yours, but like, yeah. I've not worked for them personally, but from what I hear is that that's what they do or same thing at Mile High Media with Icon Mail or Noir Mail. Like, mm-hmm. who, like, has good chemistry? Like, what can we make a good story out of? Like, yeah. you know, we have writers writing for us, and we look and say, okay, this is realistic. Okay, this is not. Can this? Okay, this yeah. we can't do. So that's what they were saying was that we like the story. Like, you know, it's, and like, and now that we're friends with you, it's odd to see you fuck. We just want to hear you talk about, like, your cousin or your brother or this or that or, you know, whatever you're doing. So it was just interesting to me that, you know, females, so I can understand that females want to watch gay porn mm-hmm. like guys want to watch lesbian porn and I yeah. think that that's okay it yeah. just took me by surprise I just didn't think it was a thing but like there's yeah. some not thinking you know yeah I think um I've seen some gay porn and it's pretty hot. it can be pretty hot it can be hot and yeah. sometimes I'm the same way sometimes I want to watch the story and know like what's going on sometimes yeah. I'm like all right just fast forward through this but, yeah like, you know and I think that there's people that want to do all of that so yeah that's really cool yeah, it's interesting, right? It's just, I think everyone go on your Twitter and hit your analytics button today and see who's following you <laughs> and play to your audience. Yeah, I've done that a few times and it's literally like 96% male. And um, the top cities that follow me are like like Tehran and like Mexico City. I have a lot like, of Brazil. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, sometimes Brazil. People have contacted me from Brazil saying that if I went there, I would not be able to sit down or function for like a week afterwards. And I was <laughs> like, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Not that's a good or a bad thing. My boyfriend's over here making a face about that. Uh, but so I get a lot of followers from the UK, um, US, and Brazil. Just Brazil, 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 Brazil. Like every when you look at your uh, your weekly summary, yeah. some all, yeah, it's always like at least eight hundred people from Brazil. I'm like wow. it's so crazy. It's crazy. It is. So you we've we've referenced your boyfriend a couple of times. So Clark Davis, yes. Um, and how do you guys? Because I've asked people who are in the straight industry, like how their relationship works. Cause the one thing that a lot of people are curious too, is like, how can you have a committed relationship and like have sex with other people for a living? So how do you guys do that? Do you only have sex with other people if it's for work or do you have an open relationship or how does that work? Uh, We have a closed relationship, but uh, we just have, uh, we just, have sex with other people. If it's for studio work only, not Mm -hmm. only fans or just for fans or anything like that. Okay. Um, when I met him, I thought he was a dick at first. I messaged him on Twitter and was like, hey, like, you're so cute, whatever I said. And he responded, oh, thank you so much. Like, always looking for new friends. If you ever want to film some content or hook up, let me know. And I was like, ah, screw this guy. So yeah. I was just like, went on my way. And then I was like, a couple months later, was like, gosh, he's fucking cute. Like, I was like, I'm just going to message him again. And then we just started talking every day. And... um then we were talking on the phone. Then we couldn't, like, you know, not talk on the phone and not text every day. And it was like this the high school thing. And I was like, oh my God, he texted me. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like, you know, um, and it happened. And the feeling was mutual. Mm-hmm. And so I told him, I was like, okay, well, maybe you should come to LA and meet me. Because um, mm-hmm. at the time he had moved from uh, Long Island to Buffalo. And I sure as hell wasn't going to Buffalo. So I was <laughs> like, I'm going to come to LA. <laughs> So I brought him here and we met at the airport at LAX and it was amazing. And we both started crying and like held each other. And, we, and this talking had been going on for like four or five months. So there was like a build up to this. Yeah. Like, you know, we talked about everything and I personally recommend talking to everybody uh, prior to, you know, going on a date. Yeah. And he showed up at LAX one day and we just kind of like spent this like wonderful weekend together and just like fell in love. And it was like really like love at first sight. And it's this beautiful story. And um, I just feel like he's the one and that he's Mr. Right. Um, And so his lease was ending and everything. And he was thinking about where to move. And I said, why don't you just move in with me? And he was like, well, we've kind of been talking for four months. We've seen each other for like a total of like, 96 hours like you know it's kind of crazy and I was like yeah it is kind of crazy but why don't you just do it yeah 
And he did. And he's been living here for a month now. So while our relationship is still new, I feel like I've known him like my whole life. I feel like he's the boy in my dreams that I was like dreaming about that never had a face. But now like he has a face and it's him. <laughs> and it's just this crazy story um, that never thought it would happen to me. I kind of gave up and was like, you know what? Love this and that. Yeah. Mm, nobody wants to date a porn star. But it, it's hard. Um I think what he does is good, and I obviously enjoy having sex with him or I wouldn't be with him. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. I love you. <laughs> He's sitting over here by me. Um, but I, um, no, it's hard sometimes. Uh, yeah. It's hard to see people that you love, even though you know it's just for work, do that because some of the faces that they make or the faces they make with you or you kind of see similarities a little bit. Mm-hmm. And though I know we're 100% committed to each other, it's it's, it's difficult at times but I think if you talk about it if you're open about your feelings um, if you talk about who your scene partners are going to be who you don't want their scene partners to be right um, then th- that's okay and we have that mutual trust and understanding um, he's a little bit more emotionally strong than me like mm-hmm. he can really like say that it's for work mm-hmm. I can do that also but it's just a little bit more difficult so it's interesting how being in a relationship with somebody who's in the adult industry actually forces like a level of communication that I think a lot of people don't ever explore if they're in like in a normal quote unquote relationship and they work normal jobs. Right. So that and then him having lived 2000 miles away for the first five months I was talking to him, like mm-hmm. really forced us to talk every day and talk about everything. Right. So when he showed up, it was like, I knew that I was going to like you. Like I kind of knew that I was going to fall in love with him and mm-hmm. I love him very much. And he, like I said, is Mr. Right. i um, not going to let him go anytime soon. I don't think anything could ever break us up. And yeah, it's interesting. Um, and it's hard. Um, no relationship is perfect. It's all a learning process, but mm-hmm. I really, really, really am thankful. Um, that, I didn't write him off as a dick for saying that we could hook up um, <laughs> if I was ever in town. Um, but no, I'm glad that everything played out the way that it did. And I think everyone should spend more time talking, communicating with people prior yeah. to just like jumping in bed. Cause that's usually it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Nick. This has been really great and, and very educational. And I feel like um, I know a lot more about the gay industry than I did before you walked in. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, no, your show's amazing. You're amazing. I followed you for some time. And when I saw the tweet, I was like, I have to do this. Um, but yeah, no, I just really want everybody to uh, be as educated as possible to make decisions for themselves, not believe everything you hear is the truth and just really like do some soul searching and just really try hard to be open-minded. It's funny because we take off our clothes for a living and we exploit ourselves in so many ways, but then we're closed minded in other areas. So yeah. if we could just be open and just build on that. Like, you know, we can be crazy enough to change the world. Maybe. Maybe. Where do you think the one good place for, if you were to say like one resource that people should go to, to learn more about HIV, um, where would that be? I would go to um, the CDC, the center for disease control, okay. CDC slash HIV or HIV.gov mm-hmm. and all the scientific research and everything that you need to know is there. And I think that's a really good place to start. Fantastic. And then can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter at Nick Fit XXX. Uh, my That's ins- Fit with two Ts, right? Fit with two Ts. Okay. Because there was a different Nick Fit with one T. And I was like, hmm. Um, so no, <laughs> at N-I-C-K-F-I-T-T-X-X-X. Please add me. I follow back. I try to talk to everybody as much as I can. Um, comment on all your comments. And um, you can also go to theadhereanceproject.org. Um, and you can reach me that way. Uh, my phone number and email are there. Uh, if you need to reach out for anything or any of the issues that we talked about, I'd be happy to help you. Fantastic. And you guys can follow me at um, Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filtered. Nick, thank you again so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. And this has been a pleasure. Thank you, Holly. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye.